What's going on all my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today we're continuing on with our cardiovascular assessment and electrocardiogram like a boss series and we're going to be looking at our idioventricular rhythms. Before we begin, I want you to take a look up here on the right side of your screen. You're going to see two different sets of stoplights. Our first set of stoplight is going to tell us about our rhythm. Is it a good rhythm? Is it a rhythm we should be cautious about? Or is it a lethal rhythm? The, those not really good rhythms. And our next one is going to be either a green person letting us know that we can play our monopoly game, collect our $200 and keep going, or it needs to be red, stop, we need to do something about this before it gets worse. So we're gonna begin by looking at our idioventricular rhythm. The rate is gonna be less than 40 beats per minute, but it will be regular. P waves will be absent, and because they're absent, there will be no PR interval. QRS intervals are gonna be wide, they're ugly, they're disgusting, they're greater than that 0.12 seconds. The definition for this rate consists of six or more ventricular escape beats occurring when the AV and SA node fail to fire. So causes for our idioventricular rhythms include hypoxemia, digitalis toxicity, myocardial ischemia, sinus bradycardia, and potential reperfusion rhythms. So interventions wise, we want to provide oxygen if oxygenation is inadequate, less than 94%. We want to give atropine, we can consider transcutaneous pacing, epinephrine, and dopamine. To begin, we have atropine. That is our first drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardias. It can also be used in our AV nodal blocks. However, there really hasn't been shown any benefit to our second degree type two heart blocks as well as our third degree complete heart blocks. You may still see it, but it just might not show benefit. So atropine dosing, 0.5 milligrams IV every three to five minutes not to exceed 0.04 milligrams per kilogram with a maximum of three milligrams. Considerations for atropine, it can cause myocardial oxygen demand, so we have to be cautious if there is myocardial ischemia or hypoxia present when providing this to our patients. Lastly, it's important to note that atropine can cause paradoxal slowing. So sometimes instead of bringing the heart rate up, it can actually make it worse and slow it down further. So we need to prepare to pace these patients in case that paradoxal slowing does occur. Talking about transcutaneous pacing, this is not fun for our patients, especially our conscious patients. So for unstable bradycardias that are less than 50 beats per minute with some kind of compromised hemodynamics, so what is that? That could be hypotension, acute altered mental status changes, shock, ischemic chest discomfort, as well as our acute heart failure patients. So what do we usually pace when we do transcutaneous pacing? Well, we do our symptomatic sinus node dysfunction rhythms, our type two second degree heart blocks, our third degree heart blocks, complete heart blocks, our new bundle branch patients that sh are showing slowing, as well as um, we're not using this for our agonal rhythms or our cardiac arrest. It shows no benefits. Cardiopulmonary CPR, if it's shockable, we're gonna shock. If not, um, we're just gonna give medications and provide CPR. So how do we set it up? We're gonna position the pacing pads on the patient as instructed by the packaging. Normally one pad goes over the right anterior chest wall and then the left pad will go on the left midaxillary line next to the heart. We want to turn on the pacer before we do anything else. And we want to set the demand rate to 80 beats per minute or whatever the physician tells you to set it to. We also want to set the current MA output. So an increased current starting with a minimum setting and moving on until electrical capture is consistent which would be a wide QRS and a T wave after each pacer spike, that means that our patient has ventricular pace, would be something that we want to see. Common current ranges between 50 to 80 MAs. So transcutaneous precautions. Conscious paced patients may require analgesia for that pacing discomfort. Remember, this is uncomfortable for our patients when they're awake because they're constantly being shocked to provide that rhythm, um, to provide that upping of that rhythm for that patient. We also want to avoid palpating carotid pulses to confirm capture. Why do we do that? 
because electrical impulses can cause muscle jerking that can mimic a pulse. So if you're checking a carotid pulse, that might not be accurate because of that constant muscle jerking caused by the transcutaneous pacing. Looking at our epinephrine, it's a little bit different in regards to dosing that we discussed before with our symptomatic bradycardia patients. But this can be given one of two ways. It can be given for our idioventricular rhythms, or it can be provided for our cardiac arrests related to ventricular fibrillation, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, a systole and pulseless electrical activity. We can provide it IV or IL dose, one milligram, that's 10 mLs of one to 10,000 solution, administered every three to five minutes during resuscitation, followed by a 20 ml normal saline flush and elevating the extremity for 10 to 20 seconds. We wanna get that medication quickly to the heart. With our beta blocker, our calcium channel blocker overdose patients, we have to give them higher doses for it to be effective. And that is usually 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. If we have profound bradycardia or hypotension present, we give between two to 10 micrograms per minute infusions and titrate based on the patient's response. So considerations for epinephrine, the rising blood pressure and heart rate may cause myocardial ischemia and increased oxygen demand of the myocardium. High doses do not improve survival rates or neurological outcomes. And higher doses may be required if there are poison or drug-induced shock present with our patients. Let's talk about that good old boy, dopamine. This is our second drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardia. It's mostly used for our hypotensive patients who have a systolic less than 100 that are also showing signs and symptoms of shock. Something that is very important to note specifically with dopamine is we don't give this medication IV push. Please, please, please never push this medication. It's always given via IV infusion. So dopamine dosing rates initially will be between two to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And we titrate based on the patient's hemodynamics, their blood pressure. Normally we're looking for a systolic rate of greater than 90. Considerations when it comes to dopamine include the fact that we need to correct hypovolemia with adequate fluid replacement prior to starting dopamine. Because this is an IV fusion and not an IV push, we need to make sure that the patient has the adequate volume to move this medication around. We also wanna use it cautiously with our cardiogenic patients, especially our CHF patients. And we need to note that it may cause tachyarrhythmias and excessive vasoconstriction. So we have to be very careful when we're titrating this medication. Lastly, you don't wanna mix this medication with sodium bicarbonate because the fact is sodium bicarb is a very alkaline solution and that can actually deactivate the dopamine, making it not effective for our patients. Lastly, we're gonna look at our accelerated idioventricular rhythm. So this rate is gonna be between 40 to 100 beats per minute. The rhythm will be regular and of course, P waves will be absent. Because P waves are absent, the PR interval will not be seen and the QRS interval will remain wide, ugly, disgusting, greater than 0.12 seconds. The definition for this rhythm is a higher rate rhythm may last between a few seconds to a few minutes with our patients. So causes for this rhythm include hypoxemia, digitalis toxicity, myocardial ischemia, we could have a sinus bradycardia, and it can also be seen with our potential reperfusion rhythms. So again, interventions, oxygenation, if oxygenation is inadequate, less than 94%, we can give atropine, consider transcutaneous pacing, epinephrine, and dopamine. I hope that this video was helpful in elevating your cardiac knowledge and helping you pass those exams like a boss. Make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where you can get copies of these resources, the PowerPoints, as well as test questions that I will be including with each one of these videos within the series. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions and make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell. Until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I can't wait to see you all again soon. Bye.